Hello and welcome to episode 18 of Making Sense, a production of Eurodollar University, where we try to understand the very foundation upon which economics and finance is built on, the creation and destruction of money. My name is Emil Kalinowski and I am joined by Jeff Snyder, who goes by the official title of Head of Global Research for Alhambra Investments. Of course, we all know him more as the curator of credit, the Father Brown of the monetary world, the Earl of the Euro dollar. Jeff, good morning. Good to see you again. Good to see you too, Emil. Jeff, we're going to talk about an article with a bucket is a big, big uh, symbol. And the first, and it's, uh, it's called, so long as the bucket is full of holes, treasury demand comes first. And uh, you wrote it on July 13th, and it's posted at Alhambra Investments. But before we dive into it, I want to wind the clock back some 36 years. In 1984, Dr. Peter Venkman, Dr. Ray Stantz, Dr. Egon Spence, and Winston Zedmore found themselves in the New York City Mayor's office, and they were asked to explain what in the paranormal was going on. And we have a trans transcript of that conversation, and here's what they said. What he means is Old Testament, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor, real wrath of God type stuff. Fire and brimstone coming down from the skies, rivers and seas boiling, 40 years of darkness, earthquakes, volcanoes, the dead rising from the grave, human sacrifice, dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria. Two generations later, Jeffrey P. Snyder, the opening line here for this article, wrote, Foreigners are dumping their treasuries. The Fed is monetizing the debt. The federal government has gone insane. Mass fiscal hysteria. Yeah, the treasury market's dead, right? The interest rates are going to skyrocket. The dollar's going to go to zero and everything else that we've heard about. Intermittently over the last dozen years that have become back, that have come full circle back again and the mainstream is convinced all of these things are going to happen. And of course, to prevent this massive hysteria from happening, the Federal Reserve is, is going to, while monetizing the debt, going to have to use yield caps to keep the interest rates low enough so that it doesn't disrupt this magnificent recovery that is currently underway, which will make the COVID-19 thing seem like a, a, like a non-event, almost a complete non-event entirely. So yes, that's the mass hysteria is that things are so good the Fed is doing such a wonderful job. Our biggest problem is inflation. Well, they're working ahead. They're thinking ahead, aren't they, though? They're preparing. Or do they think the inflation is going to be imminent? They are working ahead, but their working ahead never happens. It's <laughs> one of those things where they think this has to I mean, right, all of our scholarship, all of our beautiful, elegant econometric models – they all point to this one thing happening. Never mind that it is it, every time we predict this, it doesn't happen. In fact, usually when we predict these kinds of outcomes, the opposite thing happens. Never mind that. The numbers are what the numbers are. And how do you argue with numbers? Well, you can't argue with numbers, obviously. And no, no, no economist will ever try to argue with his own numbers because they treat these econometric models like they're their own children. Therefore, whatever the models say, no matter, no matter how worthless they are, they're going to listen to them. Let's, well, let's start it with the title. How about that? And you, it's a couple paragraphs in, you say, and I, and I guess my question is, what do you mean by this quote here? Quote, the demand comes first. Then that's in your title. Treasury demand comes first. So you say, quote, the demand comes first. That's the thing. So long as it does, supply can't be an issue. Demand, supply, in this specific instance, we're talking about the treasury market. So demand for treasuries is obviously through the roof. That's why yields are at record lows and the front end of the curve is pinned down almost to zero. It has nothing to do with the Fed or very little to do with the Fed. It's the fact that because of the circumstances that we find ourselves within, that the demand for this kind of paper is through the roof. Therefore, so long as demand remains, what the hell do we need yield caps for? Because yield caps are the situation where the Federal Reserve buys treasuries because the market doesn't want them. Therefore, the Fed is the marginal buyer keep trying to keep interest rates from skyrocketing, which can be harmful if it's disorderly in nature. 
So the Fed is saying, in, in essence, by trying to by moving toward yield caps, I mean, forget it. I, mean, I think you put it you put it very well last week, Emil, when you said that, you know, it's the it's the must have toy for the holidays for central bankers. They are going to implement yield caps. It's definitely coming, and we don't need them. Because what, what, the, what, the, what the Fed is saying, what Jay Powell is saying with deal caps is we are predicting that things are going to get so good, so inflationary, that demand for treasuries is going to fall to such a level, the Fed will have to step in and buy all of them, that whatever, whatever amount they need to keep rates from skyrocketing. And what we've seen, especially recently, is that no, there is no interruption in demand. And you go back the last 13 years, it's, in, it's, you know, it's, it's a pretty... It's a pretty well-established trend that so long as the monetary system is broken, that we'll get into the analogy of the, of the leaky bucket, demand for treasuries will always be there. And it will be there regardless of the amount that is supplied. You know, we heard all of this stuff back in 2009 when quantitative easing seemed like it was this brand new thing that was powerful and money printing and all this wonderful inflationary stuff. And we heard it again there. They didn't go into yield caps because they didn't think they needed to. But it was the same, we were going to see the dollar fall, we we're going to see interest rates skyrocket, we we're going to see inflation break out, and none of those things ever happened. So here we are again, 12 years later, with rates even lower. I mean, we're talking Jap within sight of the Japanese bond market, and yet they've, they never learned from the Japanese experience that there's always demand for safe instruments, safe and liquid instruments, so long as nothing changes. And really, has anything changed recently? No, not a thing. If anything, it's gotten worse. We've gone through this COVID-inspired shutdown, which has made all of the bad things that were driving demand before into even even more bad things that are driving demand through the roof. Well, Jeff, you I guess the only thing that's changed is that uh, it's just gotten bigger and louder, but it's still the same music that they're playing. And it's terrible music, the elevator stuff. Nobody wants that. Jeff, you ask a couple of questions in the article. I'm assuming they're not rhetorical, so I'm going to ask you to answer them. First, did the Fed actually monetize the debt? Second, does monetizing lead to inflation? Well, did they? Will it? In one sense, yes, but in another sense, no. And it's, it's a complicated issue because, you know, what the Fed bought recently was mostly bonds and notes. They stayed out of the bill market, which to me is a huge signal. I mean, we talk about this all the time, repo collateral, on the run, most liquid stuff. Don't buy the damn bills because that's the best collateral. And what happened in, in, the, in the treasury market in, in March was a bright dividing line where the on the run stuff was the only thing that was accepted in repo or, or practically, you know, I'm speaking in absolutes and extremes here. But and so the Fed has been careful about which, you know, exactly the opposite of the way they had been in up to leading up to March when their not QE program bought exclusively treasury bills. So the Fed is being careful about what it's actually doing. So in a strict sense, it's monetizing some of the debt, but it's not monetizing all of the debt, which to people who are, you know, are predisposed to believe in inflation, they don't care either way. The Fed's buying government paper, therefore that has to be inflationary because that's what history has shown. But when you actually look at history, no, that's not always the case either. There have been periods where governments do monetize debt and it doesn't become inflationary either. So there's, there's at the very least more to the story. And when we examine the last time the Federal Reserve was in the monetizing business in the 1940s for World War II, you, same thing. Um, when you look at it specifically from the Treasury bill aspect of it, you know, the government issued tons and tons of Treasury bills which the Federal Reserve bought nearly all of them. I mean, they monetized almost all of it. I think it was something like 90-some percent at one point. All of the bills that the Treasury, Treasury sold, the Fed bought. And that was, you know, as we talked about before, that was to make sure that their three-eighths of a percent yield cap or yield uh, ceiling was maintained. So that's what the Fed was doing. And, of course, you know, that wasn't the entire story. So even though the Fed was monetizing all of these bills, and we're talking about, you know, I think it was at 1.15 billion, which was a lot of money back then. <laughs> billion used to mean a lot. So fifth, I mean, that amount of debt being monetized by the Fed, maybe it should have been inflationary, or at least it was, it was, it was pictured to be inflationary. But it wasn't. It didn't turn out to be inflationary either because there was more to the story. And the rest of the story 
was in how there was demand for government debt beyond strictly bills. The Fed didn't have to monetize very much in the certificates of indebtedness, which are other short-term treasury instruments that pay a coupon, nor did, they, nor did the Fed buy you know, even a drop in the, a drop in the bucket in the, in the notes and bonds segment. So there was demand for government debt beyond the Federal Reserve, way beyond the Federal Reserve, and that's what kept rates low throughout that period, World War II, after the Depression, simply because the baseline or the background behind it, behind whatever the Fed was doing, was not conducive to an inflationary breakout, no matter what the Fed was doing. Again, we always talk about the banking system. The banking system matters. What the banking system was saying was, <laughs> World War II is not going to be an inflationary thing. You know, the immediate aftermath of the Great Depression and then into a World War situation, that's probably not going to be conducive to massive credit growth and, you know, ins- uninspired or unrestrained monetary growth along with it. The banking system was signaling through bond yields all throughout that period that it didn't matter that the Fed was buying every bill and monetizing parts of the debt or other not parts, uh, not parts of the other parts of the debt. What did matter was the environment behind what the Fed was attempting to do. And so long as there was demand for government paper because of that background, this deflationary background, the Fed was, you know, essentially a bystander. It, it, its role was limited to limiting, uh, capping the yield on only the bill segment of the market. Jeff, earlier you said that people are concerned that the market doesn't want the treasuries, or no, that people are concerned, right? Not you're disputing that, that they obviously do want them. But, at, but just a moment ago, you also said you identified, you mentioned, reminded us what happened in March during that full body dry heave, that cat-like retching, that there was a bifurcation in the market between the on the run and the off the run U.S. Treasuries. Now, a lot of weird stuff has happened in the last 13 years, but I think that for that makes my personal top 10 craziest thing that I could have imagined would be the idea that uh, market participants were not interested in off-the-run Treasury securities. Do I have that right? Does that make it higher on your all-time crazy list? And can you explain a little bit what what are we talking about here? I don't know if it's on my all time crazy list so much as it is on my all time I told you so list. You know, it's, I hate to be that way, but that really, I mean, I've been talking about the collateral bottleneck for years, and here it, here it is showing up exactly in the treasury market. And all it means is we have to remember why do cash lenders accept collateral in return for the cash they lend, and they do it for security. But where does that security come from? The security comes from the knowledge that tomorrow, if you default on the cash loan, I have that security in my possession that I can liquidate. As long as I'm reasonably assured that I can liquidate that security tomorrow, we'll do the trade and everything will work fine. But if the market for that security tends to be, or for or any reason becomes questionable, I'm not going to want to, I'm not going to want that security. I'm not going to take it. Even if I don't care what kind of security it is, if there's no market for it, that, that I, then I run the risk of being stuck with an illiquid asset, which could cause me to loot, to, to generate a, a pretty substantial loss, which is not something anybody who's entering short term money markets ever wants to contemplate. You don't go into the repo market to lend cash thinking I'm going to lose my ass in it because you, you won't, you aren't going to do it in that situation. So if for any reason, liquidity in whatever market, even if it's treasuries, becomes suspect, it doesn't even have to disappear, it just has to be suspect, I'm no longer going to accept that collateral because I need to be assured that there's a market for it tomorrow that I can get rid of that in case you default. And usually those two things go together. You, you begin to, to be suspicious about markets at the same time you begin to be suspicious about the people borrowing cash from you, right? It's another reason to pull back from the repo market. And it's another reason why you would further prioritize the most liquid treasuries over the non-liquid treasuries. We only have a couple of minutes left in for this article, for this segment. So this will be my last question. And of course, it's an open-ended question that requires the most amount of time. So I'm putting you in a difficult position. I know it. Please excuse. So near the end of your article, you say, quote, Back then, the Fed bought all the bills and almost nothing else. 
Today, the Fed buys some bonds and hardly any bills. In both cases, the American people were and are led to believe this was and is inflationary, especially in 1947. Balance sheet expansion like this could be, but only under the right circumstances. I know when I was learning, it always helped to kind of put uh, a concept in another light to under, maybe put it in the opposite state to understand the concept. Jeff, what are those right circumstances? Um, you think about times like, or places like Zimbabwe or Argentina or, you know, Venezuela, where there, you know, there's the background in, uh, circumstances that are going on behind it are conducive to an inflationary breakout. You know, what I'm basically talking about is under deflationary conditions, like that we saw in the 40s, in the, in the 1930s, as we've seen since 2007, it almost doesn't matter what the Fed does because the Fed is a bystander. That's what, you know, getting back to the leaky bucket analogy, that's what it really means. The leaky bucket is essentially the deflation, monetary destruction, water flowing out of the, uh, the, the vessel, for lack of a better term. And what that means is, you know, what the Fed responds to is the water level falling. They're not responding to the deflation because they can't define money either. And so what they're looking at is, okay, we've got all the symptoms of a monetary crisis. Therefore, what do we start to do? They start to add water back into the bucket. They don't fix the bucket. That's the background. That's what I'm really talking about. So long as the bucket is leaking, it doesn't matter if you keep adding water to it. You're going to have to keep adding water to it. You have to keep adding and adding and adding. And in most cases where we talk about these deflationary background, the water leaks out faster than the Fed adds any money back into it, assuming the Fed actually adds money into it and being and putting them in the most charitable circumstances to begin with. So that's what we're really talking about here. If we're in a circumstance where the bucket is leaking and the Fed doesn't fix the bucket, you're not going to get the inflation. You're going to get this, this, this continuous demand for the safest, most liquid instruments. And that includes, as we talked about last week, even risky bonds, risky corporate bonds, because they're liquid as opposed to bank lending and things like that. So it's really the leaky bucket, and that's where the analogy comes in. So long as the bucket's leaking, forget it. There's, there's no inflation. There's, there's going to be demand for treasuries and, and liquid instruments. 